Hi everyone and welcome back to Learning Did Alive 2020, the afternoon session. I'm Elizabeth Patterson and I'm going to be moderating this presentation today. Sabina Oker is going to be presenting Taming the Beast, Preparing for and Managing Your Content Corpus Conversion to Ditto. Learning Did Alive is brought to you by Scriptorium, the content strategy experts. Since 1997, Scriptorium has helped companies manage, structure, organize, and distribute content in an efficient way. If you're trying to figure out how the DITA model can best support your content or you're setting up a DITA system, please contact us and we would love to work with you. LearningDITA.com and the Learning DITA, and Learning DITA Live would not be possible without the help from our sponsors, so thank you. Attendees are going to be muted during this webcast, but we still want to um, get your input during the session. So if you would, type your questions and comments at any time into the chat module. There's an option for you to submit a question, and your speaker will answer the questions at the end of this session. If you would now, go ahead and locate the questions module in the GoToWebinar interface. Also, be on the lookout during the question and answer portion of the presentation for a link to our session evaluation survey. We would really appreciate your feedback. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass things off to Sabina. Sabina, are you ready? I am ready. All right, I'm going to make you the presenter. Great. And you are good to go and can share your screen when you are ready. Okay. All right. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Yep, you're good to go. Oh, thank you very much. All right, so migrating to DITA entails many moving parts. And if you're going through this right now, well, one, congratulations at making the decision to enable a more intelligent uh, content user experience and to be prepared for the requirements and experiences of 21st century users. Second, Two, take a deep breath and don't worry, you'll be fine. So this presentation will cover just one of the work streams within the larger program of migrating to DITA, and that is converting your existing content corpus uh, into DITA XML. All right, so that's me, and thank you, Elizabeth, for the great um, introduction. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Contact Services uh, was founded by Joanne Hackos um, over 40 years ago. So for 40 years, uh, Contact Services has been pro pro providing consulting and training services for information development organizations all around the world. So we'll leave some time at the end for questions, um, but I'm always available via, via email or Slack if you think of anything else that you'd like to ask me afterwards. And my last slide will contain my contact information. So I'm gonna be doing a deeper dive into each one of these items in a later slide, but at a high level, these are some of the things that I've learned um, to include um, from the, the DIM migrations that um, I've managed. And prior to becoming a consultant, <clears throat> excuse me, at Contact Services, I managed three uh, content corpus migrations, um, and I'm presently helping one of the contact clients manage their own. In terms of the conversion to-do list, um, one of the important key things is to have a content inventory. Uh, it is, like I said, an important mission critical management and tracking through tool throughout the entire migration process. It's important to capture specifics about all of the content on your delivery platform, um, irrespective of who owns it. If you aren't converting all of the content in your corpus, make sure that you get product stakeholder input. Another important consideration is who will do the conversion? Are you gonna ask the writers to work with a tool to do the conversion um, or your information, <clears throat> excuse me, architect uh, using software which you will either buy or develop or will you hire a vendor to do that conversion for you? Will you work up, work on cleaning up your content, either pre-conversion or wait until after the content has been made available in DITA XML format? Some things during the conversion. Even if you have a detailed conversions 
uh, specification, there will be data patterns that are not accounted for that you'll find. So plan for the time to investigate and decide how best to proceed. Have a plan for what to do about the things which are true anomalies. Is it more cost effective to have a person fix those one or two instances or to ask the vendor or whomever um, to, uh, to update the conversion software to accommodate um, those edge cases? Decide how you will handle the content which is in progress, right? So um, it's, uh, it's a common reality that writers have to continue to deliver the content um, as part of the regular release cadence. So how are you going to handle that kind of content? Will you have it reconverted or will you hold it out until the end and have it converted as the last thing? And another thing that's very important is to track issues uh, for future cleanup. And as I mentioned, I'll walk through a deeper dive on each one of these um, items. In terms of the, that to-do list for after the conversion, uh, once your content is available in the DidXML format, you'll have additional tasks to take care of before you can replace uh, you can replace the new content or the old content with the new content on your delivery platform. If you didn't do any pre-conversion cleanup, there will be some things that you'll need to address. Um, I encourage you to focus on just the things that will impact negatively impact the experience of the content on your site, such as broken links, uh, any images, um, and also just that the content appears correctly. Make sure that you have all the metadata in place that you need to publish the content. Um, define an approach to get the new content out on the site, uh, whether you're going to do that sort of as an all-in-one switch, pull the switch and have your old content be replaced with the new content, or if you're going to migrate it in small batches as time permits or as you have the opportunity to uh, check and test the content. And what I'm calling the after-after, so after that, just as important as training the writers is the updates to the processes and the resources that they'll utilize as they move forward in their new data authoring environment. You'll want to make sure that you have a, a change control board or a governance board to create backlogs of changes and to document any updates um, that you make to the information model, um, your metadata, your taxonomy if you have it, and as well as any of the processes um, as you move forward. The first thing you wanted to, to, to define are the goals for your conversion. So this entails really coming up with some specifics about what is your primary driver for the conversion? Is it to have translation costs? Is it to facilitate reuse? Is it to provide a consistent experience to your users? What are your time constraints? Right? So having a tight timeline for conversions means that you're likely not to have enough time to do very much cleanup before the, uh, the conversion um, occurs. Converting your content as is means that you'll be at parity with what exists in your realm today. But conversions can also afford some opportunity for improving the overall quality of your content. Other considerations with impacts the decisions that you make about your conversion is what, what are your future plans? What is your company or your organization's future plans for enterprise endeavors like chatbots, digital transformation, taxonomy, or content uh, translation, um, the localization of the uh, software or your products, um, user interfaces? These plans will impact the semantic inline elements um, and existing and future metadata. So they should be a part of that goal as you define it. Finally, what are the resources um, that are available to you and what is the skill level of your writers? Do you need to build expertise before you can get started? Do you have a formal information model defined? Do you have someone who can make dis uh, decisions about the disposition of contents? Do you have an information architect or a content strategy that's going to be working as a part of the core team for your content conversion? 
This is part of a conversion checklist that I created for a ComTech client to help them define their conversion goals. And so these are just a series of questions that I asked the core team to ask themselves and make sure that they were able to define and articulate the responses. And you can see that this is sort of goes over some of the things that I already uh, spoke about, right? So um, what's the important priority for the conversion? Uh, what plans do you have for pre-conversion cleanup? Um, how will you handle the differences that are uncovered during the conversion? So um, a lot of uh, companies have distributed writing groups that are located in different <clears throat> locales throughout the uh, throughout the globe. So if you have a distributed writing groups um, that are located in other time zones, um, how are you going to um, navigate that decision making process so that you can all come together while actually not creating any major stops in the conversion process? How are you prior to prioritize your post conversion cleanup? What content, what percentage of your content corpus will you convert? And this is another important consideration we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk to you about in a little bit. Um, and then those questions about how do you get it into the CMS, how will you republish, et cetera, et cetera. The next step is to create, uh, to plan for your conversion. And, and so um, ideally, the conversion should happen at a time when no active content development is happening. But the pragmatic reality of an agile software development cycle means there's likely to never be a time when no writers have in progress work. So then it becomes a uh, uh, the, the, the action item is to just manage that um, scope. This is where the inventory comes into play. How much of your existing content will you convert? And how will you decide what you're going to convert and what you're going to leave as part of your legacy, or even decide to archive um, that old content at this time? Deciding whether to invest in that pre or post conversion cleanup, there's pros and cons for each approach. And so just make sure that you accommodate time and resources for getting your new data content into your CCMS and then out onto your delivery platform, right? So sometimes we talk, have um, what we call CDID um, um, member roundtables and we talk to them, we we'll have members let them talk to each other. And we recently had one about uh, content conversion and one member's comment I think is really bears repeating. He said, planning and standardization of conversion is really, really important for not painting yourself uh, into a corner as you move through the process. Just like any project, creating a conversion plan document is the key deliverable. So good project planning for any project always includes these steps. So think of the project plan as your roadmap with your articulated goals. Include the stakeholders and how they will benefit from the goals. Break the project into a list of deliverables that are needed to support the goal and the tasks that needed to complete those deliverables. So just bear in mind that the conversion of your content corpus is just one work stream within the overall uh, migration to DITA efforts. So for the other uh, work streams, such as you know, your uh, writer preparedness, the publication, back-end preparedness, um, as well as the tool selection. You should probably plan on having a project plan which covers these same um, basic pieces for each one of those work streams. So identify the roles and responsibilities of project team members. Be sure that you have a kickoff meeting to review your plan of attack. Get their input, especially if you encounter unexpected resource or time costs. Identify your risks. I create a budget or provide input to a budget if you're not responsible for the project dollars. This is where the scope is essential, especially if you have to get estimates from conversion vendors. Create a project timeline and add the specific milestones. Determine, and this is another one that's really, really important, is determine a progress reporting framework. So when, where, and how often will you update the key stakeholders or project sponsors on your progress to date? And that's a really important one for um, expectation management that I found. You heard me talk about the difference between parity and innovation. I think the primary difference um, is 
the I think that this this distinction between getting the same thing that you had before and being able to have improvements in the content quality is an important distinction to keep in mind as you contemplate your pre-conversion work, right? So converting your content as is means you'll be in parity with what exists today. But you can have those opportunities to improve the overall content, um, uh, content quality. Um, my recommendation is to always prioritize all your must-haves and then as well to identify what those other opportunities might be like and then either to be able to assess whether you have the time and the resources to be able to uh, take advantage of those opportunities or whether if you're hiring a conversion con vendor, uh, vendor if they can um, help you achieve those um, those opportunities or that is going to be prioritized at a time after the deployment. So focusing on the defining and focusing on the must-haves will ensure that you don't have any degradation in the quality as you move into production, and that's really important. So I ask clients to consider this your minimal viable product. Once you identify all of those opportunities or potential opportunities for um, increasing the quality of your content and the level of effort that's required for each one, then you'll be more able to accurately prioritize the completion of one. So, for example, some must-haves, right? So all resulting data content should be in alignment with your new information model, and hopefully you'll have a new information model. Any metadata that's needed for publishing content to your delivery platform obviously needs to be in place. All images and links must appear and be functional. And any current reuse mechanisms, um, if you have you know, FrameMaker, if you use snippets, or if you have conditionals, um, if you have product variables, any of those pieces that are already in place should remain in place as you um, move forward. So some opportunities for improvement that could have a good return on your investment for you um, and may um, that conversion may be able to help identify is that replacing duplicate content with a data reuse mechanism such as content references or library topics, keys or condition. And that's a really that's a really big um, if you uh, if you have a high percentage of duplicate content in your content corpus then eliminating even 20% means that that's 20% less content that your writers have to support as you move forward. That's a pretty big return on your investment. Um, separating task and concept information, right? So we, I call that Franken topics, where if you've munged uh, conceptual information in with procedural information, separating those into two different topics is another area where you can improve the quality of your content and the user experience of your content on the delivery platform. And then also um, replacing um, uh, inline links, uh, links, cross-reference links with related links or relationship tables um, if the data patterns exist to be able to identify them and replace them. So some other opportunities for improving the content, your, the quality of your content will usually require writer investment and can't generally be identified during the conversion process. And that's rewriting and restructuring the content to make it more topic-based, standalone, or be able to be reused. Um, applying principles, any principles of minimalism, and then also adding semantic intelligence via, uh, via tags. So those are some examples of that difference between parity um, and innovation. So having a complete accurate content inventory is probably the most important deliverable for your content uh, conversion, in my opinion. Um, so some of the information that you should capture on your inventory is the, what's the file name, what's the publication title, what's its source format, where does it live, what's product's name or names that it's associated with, what is the status of that product, who's the writer that's responsible for it, who's the product manager um, or the development uh, and or the engineering manager um, that's responsible um, for that product, when was it last updated, where is it living? on the delivery platform um, and uh, what is the priority of the product that it documents. So you'll use this inventory as a management and tracking tool for the conversion process. It may be useful for you to as you decide to who will to convert the content 
um, but it will give you data to to determine the scope of your conversion and also if you have page count data if you need to get a quote from a conversion vendor you'll already have the information that you need to get that if you've never done um, a content audit or had a content inventory you should count on at least three months um, to to create one um, and it'll take longer if you need to get input or buy-in or sign off from other key stakeholders such as the developers, the product managers, or even your legal organization. It's kind of like having your kitchen redone. It always costs more and takes longer than you think it's going to. So the last organization I worked at before joining Comtech, we migrated from um, uh, Flare and FrameMaker into Dita. Um, and we uh, scoped the conversion for existing content corpus by assigning a priority to all the content in that corpus using this four tier um, scale. It was really effective for us to keep our eye on the prize as we moved forward. It also helped writers as product managers sometimes shifted the priorities from three to one. So since we'd had the buy-in and, um, and sign-off from the product managers, it was really an easy mechanism for writers to negotiate with those stakeholders as we move forward um, about changing the scope of the priority because the, um, the priority of the product it documented had changed. So this notion of prioritization is also a really good way to focus resources um, if you are there, if the resources are limited or if you're under a really tight timeline um, to just be able to focus on the, uh, the most strategic content. So it may be that you don't have to go to this uh, prioritization process, but in case you do, um, I this is the way that I have, I decided this, um, this tiering system. Um, the most strategic content was the tier one, and there was the criteria for defining what made it the most strategic um, information, as well as what was its disposition as part of the conversion process. And then the sort of two was the pragmatic reality of knowing that even though the content should be completely accurate and current, it may not be. And then we have this uh, number three, right? So we just decided we were gonna scope it by just converting um, just by inputting the output into the CMS. And as it turns out, um, the vendor cost for conversion was so uh, reasonable that we were able to uh, convert all the tier three, which we did not anticipate. And then the opportunity um, for that organist for our organization was we're around the tier four. We had content that we identified like, why do we even still have this? Um, so we were just able to jettison um, and archive that content as we move forward. And we wouldn't have been able to do that if we hadn't had an inventory and also a prioritization mechanism. All right, so next on deck in terms of things to do is when's the best time to convert? Um, given writer deliverables, there may never be a time when nobody is working on something. Um, but here, there are other considerations for when to convert. Um, you got to make sure that your team has enough skills and resources to plan and execute the conversion. Um, uh, and also that you can leave the bulk of the content alone for the amount of time it takes to con get converted. Now, that is a very finite amount of time, but you have to be able to not have everything be in progress um, during the time of your conversion. The publishing tools need to be ready to support that converted content, and you have to know who is going to be doing the conversion and have all the pieces in place for that. All right, so who is going to do the conversion? This is a critical decision. So it's always a recommendation, um, no matter what book you read or resource you take a look at or what consultant you talk to, it's always the recommendation that if you have the means and the resources to do so, that you hire somebody to convert your content for you. Um, the conversion vendor will create a conversion um, software that is specific to your content environment, to your source content environment. And even as you iterate the conversion specification when new data patterns are identified, the resulting data XML is going to be of higher quality than by any of the other means. So utilizing in-house resources, such as your information architect or even your writers, 
um, will require that those resources have an advanced knowledge of DITA, they have time to complete the conversion, they have knowledge of the conversion tools. So if you're lucky enough and you have toolsmiths, um, publishing engineers or information engineers or whatever you call them in your organization and you are able to, to prioritize having them build a conversion script for you, remember that there are still costs associated with this approach. A conversion vendor will do Q&A and testing to ensure that the resulting converted data content is in compliance with your information model, uh, information model, but it's likely that somebody from your team is going to need to do that testing in QA if you do it, uh, if you do the conversion in-house. All right, so I'm going to walk you through the pros and cons for each one of these three approaches, right? So the only time when it doesn't 120% make sense to have a con uh, vendor convert your content is maybe when you um, are planning for extensive rewrites to the content uh, to make it more topic-based uh, before you convert it, um, or if you aren't any under any time constraints whatsoever. When I managed uh, did a conversion prior to joining Comtech, I wrote a proposal that outlined the pros and cons for each approach, and I was so pleasantly surprised at how reasonable the cost was to have it done uh, that it was became very uh, very easy, <coughs> excuse me, for me to convince the management to pay the cost of conversion and in order to be able to accelerate the process. So I'll just go over some of the pros right there. The, the vendors who do conversions, they really are the experts. That's all they do. There's a great return on investment of that money by the quality of the content that you get back, the speed uh, on which they do the conversion, and the preparedness of your content for being able to be migrated into your CMS and then published on your back end. I'd also, and this is really important, allows for parallel work streams. So the, con the vendors can be off to working on the conversion and this core team can be working on some of the other um, work streams for your migration to DITA or even other aspects of the content conversion. And you can start the conversion before the writers are even trained. On the downside, right, so um, it will ask add some costs, not just time costs, to the project. It takes time to gather the content. I was really surprised at how long it's taken us um, to be able to gather all of the disparate source content, especially if you don't have a CMS and you have a distributed writing environment. Um, it may take longer than you think to just literally gather up all the source content, put it into a directory in a OneDrive or FTP site or wherever it is that you're going to be the um, is going to be the distribution point of how you're going to get that content to the to the vendor. And it will still require resources for analysis, issue resolution, and also cleanup just the volume and the, the complexity of the question. So this is my from my conversion checklist. So these are some important questions to ask vendors um, that you are considering for converting your content, right? And there's a lot of things that about just det 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 determining what's your service level agreement for communications. Um, the vendor is gonna want you to turn any questions or any uh, emails that they send to you um, that require a decision as quickly as possible because that's what slows down um, that that's what slows down um, the uh, the conversion. But you can see that there's um, certain other certain other questions that you absolutely should ask about whether or not being in full compliance with your information model is an extra uh, charge. Uh, multiple iterations of the conversion, the same content are possible, right? Um, have they done? Um, depending on what your um, what your source. Have they done a large conversion project utilizing that source um, format before? Right, so what files do they need to do the conversion? Will they create the maps? Will they align the file names with your file naming conventions if you have defined them already? And then you, number 12 is very important. Ask the vendor to articulate their Q&A and review process and what they are gonna expect from you during, um, during that time. All right, so in-house writers, just bear in mind that if you um, are asking writers to do the conversion, that you're asking them to do really the hardest part of any data migration at a time when they aren't trained and perhaps they don't yet have the skills and the expertise that are needed to be able to do a bang up job. 
One important thing to remember is that even if writers are handling the heavy lifting of the conversion using some you know, per, uh, software, conversion software that you've purchased, you still need somebody who's going to review the resulting data XML to make sure that it meets that must-haves, that minimal vital, vital uh, viable product requirements. So you can see here um, there's some of the pros and the cons from um, having the writers um, having the writers do the conversion. I just want to draw your attention to one of these, and that is not all tools are created equally. I did a fair amount of research on the availability of com commercially available tools, and they really were not the same. And you get what you pay for. Um, the conversion uh, the conversion tools that I felt would be most likely to be able to meet the needs of our requirements were the ones, of course, that cost the most money. All right, so if you have a toolsmith or um, an information or publishing engineer, not everybody has that function. Um, the engineer could create a script or scripts to create your existing source content to DITA. Um, but that the important consideration, and this is the same to a lesser or greater degree in each one of these options, but you still need to have people that's going to review the converted content and to do some cleanup. One thing I want to draw your attention to in terms of the cons of this approach is that the engineering timeline might not align with yours. And unless you have some sort of a management edict that can say, yes, we want you guys to prioritize um, developing a conversion script or scripts for us over the other work that you're doing, um, sometimes that means that that could push out your conversion timeline um, uh, through um, a factor that is beyond your control. All right, so you've assembled the team, you've created a plan, you've hired a conversion vendor. So the next step in the conversion process is to define your conversion strategy. And pretty basically, there are two approaches for that strategy, to clean up before the conversion or to clean up after the conversion. If your content is already modular and topic-based, woohoo, you're in a great shape as you move forward. If your content varies um, depending um, on the writing group or even the source tool, well, then you, you may have a lot of work ahead of you. And it may be that you need to utilize the phased approach to prepare, prepare your content for a conversion. But here are some of the um, main considerations. What is the state of your content? What resources do you have available? And when are they available? And what's the existing level of skill and experience with creating sort of you know, effective topic-based information uh, in DITA? So clean up your content after, uh, clean up your content before your conversion, right? So um, there's that old expression of a garbage in, garbage out. Uh, so content which is old or was never released, why pay to have something converted which isn't exactly needed? So that last bullet on the con side is significant. If you are moving forward into a new paradigm, um, then as an organization, do you want to invest in your legacy content? And if so, how much do you want to invest in your legacy content? And by the new paradigm, I mean that if you previously only published long form PDFs that were monolithic books and you're um, implementing at the same time as your migration, a new delivery platform, which will allow you to give your users uh, dynamic uh, topic based content based on metadata and a taxonomy, and it's going to be presented in pure HTML form, then how much do you want to invest in that legacy content as you are moving forward? So here's the pros and cons of cleaning up your content after the conversion, right? So it's easier because the content is already in topic forms. I always recommend that if you go the post-conversion cleanup routes, which is the route that that all the projects that I've ever been involved with have gone, that you divide the cleanup into two buckets, right? So quality audits for getting yourself to that minimal viable product so that you can push your content out to your delivery platform in the new format, and then stuff that requires rewrites of some kind or analysis um, of some kind. 
right? So sometimes once the content is converted, management is reluctant to go back and do the cleanup saying, yes, that's behind us, we're converted, let's just move forward. So, but waiting to clean up the content. So you can also tie the cleaning up of the content to um, the release process. So that if a writer is working on content for a new release, then you say, oh, by the way, in addition to documenting these new features and functions, we also want you to do the following cleanup things. Uh, but tying, but waiting to clean up that content for the next release means you won't be able to replace the old version with the new version. And, excuse me, depending on the state of the content and the timing of the training, the writer may need to continue to do updates on the original document and the old source tool. And obviously, that's not even parity. Um, so again, depending on the conversion vendor that you select, it may be that you uh, they have identified content which is duplicate in your content corpus and you have the opportunity, right, so either as part of your post-conversion cleanup process or included in your ongoing content strategy to create reusable content objects using whatever the did or reuse mechanism that you've defined in your information model and so that you're sort of able to get a, a jump start. Um, into an improvement, significant improvement into your content quality. So this is a sample of an element mapping that I did for a DITA to DITA conversion on the disposition of all elements in a content corpus. So I created this list by using sort of DITA maps metrics that's available in Oxygen. Um, so I want to make sure that I have enough time for questions, so I'm going to skip my short demo that I was going to show you where that lives, but if I have enough time and there aren't any questions, I can show you where that is. Um, so I'm really large maps, which had maps um, of all the topics in the corpus declared in them. So uh, we created this, the client and I created this notion of the mega maps that had all of the maps declared in them. And so running this report gives you a list of every single, uh, every single element that is included in that map. Um, there were five mega maps, so I just deduped the list across those five uh, reports and then um, used uh, the new information model to determine um, the mapping. All right, during the conversion, you plan on these activities. So iterating the con conversion specification as the new data patterns are identified. The vendor will communicate the issue with you and identify an example and that you, your IA or the core team will need to decide what's the disposition. So some examples might include EPS or other unsupported images, um, files which are missing, um, either they weren't included in the co uh, conversion files, um, files that were included in the source content but that are not itemized in the FrameMaker table of contents. Um, uh, a use case for my organization was that writers would um, create the content but they wouldn't um, add it to the table of contents because they were documenting unreleased features um, or the features that they were documenting were still um, in progress. Um, and also um, elements which are not in the information model or on your element mapping. All right, so another important consideration is to apply the 80-20 rule. Before you ask the vendor to iterate the conversion software, try to investigate whether this is a one-off anomaly, anomaly or truly a new data pattern. Determine whether it's more cost-effective and time-effective to have somebody clean up that one or two files that are, have problems in them uh, than it is to, uh, to change the software and have the resulting delay. All right, so one recent example um, at our client was that they found a non-unique ID. Um, both the topic and its title had the same ID, so obviously that was creating some problems in the issue, but as it turns out, that really was a one-off mistake. So it was much easier just to sort of remove um, that duplicate ID than it was to just have the software look for duplicate um, IDs uh, everywhere. Right, so hopefully you'll have decided on what is the disposition of that in-progress content, right? So some of the options you have are double updates in the old uh, source tools and in the new source tools once the content has been converted to convert that content first and then have the writer work in a pre-production environment. And this is something that I've recommended as an information architect. Uh, I like to have writers working in a new environment as quickly as possible, even if all the publishing pieces aren't quite in place yet, just to keep the momentum going. Uh, you could also wait till the content freeze part of the cycle um, for the software development. Um, 
and content development and then convert those that in progress content last. So I always say, if there are single occurrence issues which come up, keep track of them in the inventory spreadsheet, right? So you may be able to add them uh, to the cleanup stage or to be able to track them for future revision. So it's another useful uh, purpose for your inventory. Right, so I use the inventory to track the progress of the content as it moves through the conversion, cleanup, and migration process, right? So my inventory spreadsheet tracks when the content was set to the vendor for the conversion, when it was returned from the, uh, from the vendor as converted data XML, when it was migrated into the CMS, and when it was cleaned up. So this is part of the useful for if you're doing progress reporting to your stakeholders and your management, it's useful for being able to say we have X percentage of our content corpus in one week, we have X plus whatever percentage of content corpus um, converted and migrated in the next, in the next week. Um, some other things that you can work on during the conversion, uh, conversion is to, uh, while the vendor is working on the conversion, you can create your information architecture for the content on your CCMS system. You can create all of your workflow, users, roles, and permissions in the CCMS. Um, and, and then you can also, if you have the opportunity, I'm a big fan of Tiger Teams, so maybe necessarily the writer who's responsible for a particular either doc set or publication doesn't have the cycles to dedicate or it's doing cleanup, but there might be other writers or other people in the organization which do. So deputizing a tiger team that just has the tasks of getting through these cleanup, um, uh, cleanup tasks as quickly as possible and also to then to just schedule the time when they're going to do that. All right, so this is another one. So republishing your converted content. Decide who is going to do that. So some of your options are your writers or your tiger team as part of the cleanup. Maybe you can ask your CCMS vendor to help you, or maybe you can um, hire a contractor. Um, making your new versions of your documentation available on the delivery platform is another potential writer resource cost that's associated with content conversion. Um, if you engage a vendor to convert the content for you, they will deliver the DITA XML files to an FTP site or some other file sharing service. Somebody from your organization or somebody who hires a contract will need to complete these tasks. So they're, um, uh, they'll need to make sure that um, the content was migrated into the CCMS, add any metadata as needed. Um, they may need to, depending on what your tool is, create the notion of publication, apply keys, variables, or conditions. Hopefully, um, that will be done for you um, by the vendor. But if there's anything in your source content that was not correctly done, then that would be an area of cleanup then to apply the transforms to make your HTML output or your PDF output and then to republish it. I'm a big advocate of republishing content all at once rather than doing it slowly over time because I think it's a great way to, to um, recap some return on investment for the conversion process, right? So you've just spent two plus years working to migrate to a new publishing environment. And if one of your business drivers is how the consistency of that content format and structure improves the experience that, that your users will have with your content on your site, and allows you to brand that experience, well, then this is a really good way to show the management and the stakeholders how great even quasi-legacy content looks now. All right, so, so let's say in terms of this, um, you decided that you want to publish your content out to your delivery platform as soon as possible for the first bucket, go back to those must-haves you supply to the conversion vendor, right? No broken links, all the images are appearing, um, no visual wackiness, and that includes in tables. Um, you've, you've solved all of your required cleanup issues. Everything else, you can either wait until the system is live or have the tigers work on the cleanup. Um, you have to decide whether or not do you want to push that new formatted content out um, or if you want to have um, the writers work on the new content or in the in-progress content immediately in your new system, even if all the pieces aren't in place yet. Right? Another approach is to only publish the new versions of the in-progress content and then slowly work through the rest of the converted content. Um, I recommend this less. 
as a solution for the following reason, right? So there's the momentum when the content is initially available and waiting to republish decreases the likelihood that it will get republished before there is a revision to the content. So in other words, it won't get pushed out to the delivery platform until there is a reason to do it. And usually that reason is, uh, is a release of the product that it documents. Um, one of the benefits, another reason for why I, I, I don't str so strongly advocate the approach of the slow but steady uh, drip of content onto your plat uh, new content onto your delivery platform um, is one of the benefits of moving to Dita is to offer that unified experience, right? So um, it is that return on investment to have that branded look appear on the delivery platform all at once. Right, so not moving to from the old to the new necessitates keeping the old tools around. If writers who are still comfortable in their old tools continue to write in the old formats, then the converted content will quickly become out of date. So there is a sort of little bit of a change management um, issue that's uh, at play here. So once you've um, you've completed the content conversion, the next steps is to really to, to, to define your um, content strategy, right? So remember, getting your content, converted content into your new CMS isn't the end of the process. In some way, it's just the beginning. Now that you have all those foundational pieces in place that you can extend or scale the intelligence that you have on your content and your information, adding metadata or taxonomy values by making the content more modular to moving away from documenting features and functions to more user role or Goal-based, right? Those are all the stuff you're going to get from being in a structured markup publishing environment. Um, but some of the things that you just remember: don't you don't have to boil the ocean. It's an iterative process. Your style sheets, your metadata, your content strategy will all undergo changes over the next six months, a year, and beyond. You can't do everything. So focus on what's the most important, what gives you the best return on your investment, or whatever is the most important um, and significant, and then just track the others. That's the key. Don't let any other things slip between the crack. And that's why I suggest that you track at the publication levels any issues which aren't mission critical to that minimal viable product so that you can incorporate these and other quality improvements into your, the process writers follow when they're planning uh, for new and revised contents. You likely already have a process by which the writers work with their develops to, to, to determine what are the features and what are the feature details. And then you just add to that process to say whenever you're touching content, you're also going to check for, you know, is there anything that you can add as take out as an inline ink and link and put as a relationship table is there any um, semantic inline element markups in accordance with your information model that you can uh, you can make certainly if there's anything like a bold or an italics uh, that's hiding in that content corpus to replace that with a, with some sort of a more meaningful uh, markup Right. So as I've mentioned before, and it's always worth repeating, if you can allot extra cycles for your writers to do these things, consider establishing a tiger team. And if you can't have a tiger team, then consider hiring a contractor. If your conversion vendor supplied you with the information about what content in your corpus is duplicate and you don't have the times and resources to operationalize that information as part of your post-conversion cleanup, you can add that to your go-forward content strategy. All right, so the last thing that I'm going to talk about uh, in terms of um, the next next steps is the need for a change control board um, or a governance. Just remember, your information model and all the processes that you've defined to support and enable your content creation lifecycle are just a snapshot, right? They're just a finger snap in time, and they will need to change and evolve as your requirements do. So not all governance boards need to be formal, but they're in essential for maintaining compliance to the information model and your content standard, stat, standards and for you to be able to execute against your group or enterprise content strategy. And it also helps with change management because the writers need to know that if things are not working for them that they have a mechanism a forum by which they, they can request that things change. I have a sample um, taxonomy governance chart or document which talks about sort of the essential components um, of that. But pretty basically, they are to define the roles 
of the people who are going to be the stakeholders or participants in the governance board or cha uh, change control board? Uh, what's the voting mechanism? Are you going to use a majority? Are you going to use a consensus vote for approving changes? And what's the term of members? You don't want to have um, being a part of a change control board be a life sentence. Um, what is the process for requesting, making, and implementing changes? What's the process for adding new content domains? Sometimes implementing a structured market publishing environment is a, if you build it, they will come kind of arrangement. And suddenly you might find that um, other content, uh, content domains such as training um, want to be a part of your, um, of your CCMS environment. And so you need a process for how are you going to bring them on board? What is your communications going to look like to your stakeholders, to your consumers, uh, to other parts of the organization, right? So what is the process for approving changes um, and updates? Uh, what is your ship cadence? When are you going to push out those changes and make them available? You need to change request form. You need to have what is your management to, to itemize your management support. You need to really document who are your stakeholders and the racy of those stakeholders. Uh, and then also to create a change backlog, right? For these are the changes that we are not doing right now, but to keep track of them for the future. So I always try to include a resources slide. So here are some um, conversion related resources um, that may be of use to you as you move forward. And here is my question slide with my email from Comtech. So if you think of something you neglect to ask me at the end of this session, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Great, thanks so much, Sabina. Um, I do have a couple of questions here, so I'm going to go ahead and ask those. If you do have any questions, you all can go ahead and drop those into the chat module, and I will be happy to ask those questions. Um, the first one is just if you could go into a little bit more detail about what a tiger team is. Oh, sure. So I think of a tiger team as that they may be writers um, that are working on other publications, um, I know some of the organizations that I've worked for, they have summer interns. Um, so they are people that are just coming on board, just starting out their technical writing um, or even UX um, careers. Um, so they're really just a, consider them to sort of a mobile workforce um, that you might be able to deputize. You might be able to get and make an arrangement with their manager to say, well, we'd like to have 10 hours a week uh, for these five people for this duration of time because we need help with just somebody going into this data XML and making the changes. We will train them how to do that. We will give them instructions on how to do it, but we just need, literally, we just need boots on the ground that will help us. Okay, great. So Thank you. that answers the question. Mm -hmm. um, to address another question, uh, there will be recordings available after uh, Learning Data Live. So we will have the recording for recordings for each presentation available on our website by the end of this week. Um, just to let you know. Another question, uh, you mentioned earlier cleaning up your content after conversion. Mm -hmm. What types of things usually need to be cleaned up after conversion? Well, um, so anything that the conversion vendor flags as a requires cleanup, right? So if there's something that requires a person to intervene and take a eyeball it, right, and say, well, um, this is really a this. And sometimes those, you've heard me talk about those Franken topics where you've got procedural information and, um, uh, and conceptual information. Mm -hmm. Well, those two, the information models for a task does not really accommodate a great deal of conceptual information. So on, level, on some level, it could be that somebody needs to take a look at that and be able to just say, okay, we're gonna break this, we're gonna make this a concept, we're gonna make this a task. So sometimes there'll be other sort of sub substructures, subtasks within tasks that might require somebody to take a look at it and, and determine um, is this uh, the way that we want to uh, go. Same with lists, um, okay. maybe that there are some um, images that need to be found. So those are just a few examples of some of the post uh, conversion cleanup items. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay, so it looks like we are out of questions. So if anyone has anything else that comes up or that you think of, um, feel free to email Sabina. Her email is on the screen now, or you can also send your questions to experts at learningdata.com and we'll drop that email into the chat box. Um, 
I also have just dropped a link to the evaluation survey into the chat box. So if you could take a few minutes to fill that out, we would really appreciate the feedback. Uh, Sabina, I don't see any more questions, so I believe this okay, concludes great. our session. Thank you so much. Oh, sure, you're welcome. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Scriptorium, to come and give this presentation, and I hope that, um, that the people found something uh, of use in their uh, conversion endeavors. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much.